sermon for you tonight that is going to change you if you will open it up and receive it, not because it's me, but because it's the Word of God. But there are five words, five words that will change your world, that will take this church to another level, that will take your life to a God adventure that you've never known anything about. And God gave me this. The Holy Spirit spoke to me this in my prayer time. And he said, these are the five words I want you to tell the people. And the five words are this. Put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their shoes. So many times we pray for boldness. We don't need more boldness. We need more love. If we had love and love people the way that Jesus loves them, we would put ourselves in the shoes of others that it's easy to criticize it's easy to to look at people i was on a plane the other day and there was a, a flight attendant that came over on the speaker and said with well, this one nine hundred voice i want you to uh, put your seat backs and trade tables up in the upright position i'll be going i thought whoa she's trying way too hard to be a little sexy with that voice right there <laughs> who's she trying to seduce the whole plane you know <clears throat> and gets to the end of the thing he says, if I can do anything at all, just let me know. You know, whatever. And he said, and, and, and then said, uh, my name is Martin, if you need anything. <laughs> and I said, good Lord. And I began to pray. And I said, God, help me in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, speak to me. Because Martin is caught in Satan's spider web. He thinks he's a woman. He dressed and I seen him and he has his nails painted and, and you know and all this. I don't look at people like that in disgust. I look at them as somebody that desperately needs the touch of the Jesus that I know. And so I said, Holy Ghost, you give me a specific word for Martin. And you tell me exactly what to say and I'll go tell him. So I was sitting there and I, I just and it just I don't know, plane gets up. At the specific time, Holy Ghost said, go now. I got up, unbuckled my seatbelt, walked up to the front by the restroom. He was sitting there eating a salad. I turned around first of all and said, hey, Martin, how are you doing? He said, oh, you remember my name? I said, yeah. I said, you're excellent at what you do. I want to tell you, you're an excellent uh, flight attendant. And, and, you, and, and he was shocked. He was a little taken back that I would say that. But let me tell you something. When you compliment someone, <clears throat> it brings a wall down. It brings a wall down. I've seen my wife so many times go up to uh, a girl with a green mohawk, tattoos all over her face, piercings and, and everything all over something that looks like the scariest thing. And Selena will walk right up to him and go, oh, I love that. I love that ink on your arm. What does that say? And they, they look so shocked. <clears throat> you know, they're like, says, uh, serve Satan. You know, like, oh, okay. Well, that's, it's pretty. It's pretty, you know. And then she'll end up witness to him, praying with him. So anyway... I, I, I walked up to him and, and after I complimented him, I said, Martin, I don't know if you believe in God or not, but I said, I'm a man of God and I'm a pastor. And I said, I have a word for you. Thank you, brother. I said, I have a word for you. And I said, it's a word from God. I said, God Almighty wants me to tell you something. And his eyes got this big. And I'm telling you, his jaw literally dropped. And he said, God said to tell me? I said, yes. And he said, what did he tell you? And I was like, God, what do I, what am I telling you? <laughs> so I said, I just opened my mouth and I knew the Holy Ghost would let, it, would let it happen. And I said, Jesus told me to tell you that when you were born, he had this amazing, beautiful plan for your life. And I said, Satan will come and try to derail us from that plan. And I said, God has a life for you, Martin, that's more glorious and more beautiful with more purpose than anything you've ever dreamed of. But first, you must surrender your life totally to Jesus if you want to know what that life is like. And I, and I said, I'm going to pray for you, brother, and I'm going to remember your name. And when I walked away, he was still literally in shock that I told him that. <clears throat> I can't tell you that he got saved. I, I don't know what happened when I walked off the plane. He was telling people, bye, good day, good day, thank you for coming. He saw me, and again, he went. <laughs> like, just like that. You know what? You, some people say, well, that, that took boldness. 
No, it didn't take boldness. All I had to do was put myself in his shoes. Maybe Martin got molested when he was a kid. Maybe Martin grew up with someone that treated him horrible, beat him, called him names. Maybe he had to steal to eat. Maybe he grew up on the street. You don't know. Come on, church people. Would you be any different than the MS-13 people if you grew up in a house where God's name was only used in, in cursing? Would you be any different than that prostitute if you grew up with pornography on the TV and alcohol in the refrigerator, dope smoke in the air, and drug deals going on in your house and somebody turning tricks over here? Would you be any different than the worst of the worst if you grew up in their house? I'm telling you, God told me to tell you tonight that everywhere you go, if you want to be like Jesus, you need to be able to put yourself in their shoes. Is that all right? Let's go to the word. How about Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38. And I want you to notice what he says, what it says right here, and it's talking about Jesus. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, everybody say saw. He was moved. I want everybody to shout moved. moved. He saw and he was moved. He saw and he was moved. I want you to get that into your spirit tonight. He saw and he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as a sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto the disciples, the harvest, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. I've never seen so many American pastors on TV and everywhere else telling people, you don't need to do anything. Jesus done it all. Oh, it's the cross plus nothing. You, you don't have to try. If you try to do anything, I never heard such wrong doctrine in my life. Jesus said the harvest is ripe, but the laborers. Jesus did all of his part. Yes, he did not do yours and mine. The world has turned it up to 10 where they're doing more debauchery, trying to abort babies outside of the womb and everything else. And they've turned it up and, and pastors are telling people, take it easy, Jesus done it all. What a lie from hell. The laborers are few. Verse 38, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He saw and he was moved. Let me tell you this. Anyone in church can see, but only a few in the church are moved. That's why Jesus said, my laborers are few. I grew up in Pentecostal churches when I was a kid. It was easy to see and criticize. Oh, we could point out sin. We were black belts at spotting it. Sinner, sinner. Grease pole to hell, sinner. Grease pole to hell with gasoline britches. Sinner, sinner. We're good at seeing sin. Professionals. We could see it and criticize it. We could see it and shake our head. But so many times the church has what's called the bystander effect. Do you know what the bystander effect is? The, by, the bystander effect says if, if, one, if a group of people, a large group of people seeing a woman getting attacked in public... She's less likely to get help if there's a bunch of people because everyone is thinking someone should do something. But if there, she's more likely to get help if there's one man or one woman standing there and no one else because they say, I have to do something. The church are world champions at driving by the orphans, the widows, the prostitutes, the drug addicts and saying, somebody should do something. Somebody needs to do something. How about you put yourself in their shoes? How about you act like that was your son or your daughter? How about you act like that it was your mother? How about that you act like that that was someone that you deeply, deeply love? Because if you love the way Jesus ought to love, you're going to love them so much that you're going to do, you're going to be moved to compassion. Let me explain it to you this way. If you saw a burning house, You'd drive by it and say, wow, I hope no one's in there. You would see it and hope no one was in there. But if you saw a burning house and you knew your child was in there, you would be moved. Moved. Why? Because you have more boldness? It's not boldness I'm talking about. Because you have more love for what's in that house. 
So if you and I loved everyone the way Jesus loves them, we would see and be moved. You have to act like that everyone that you come across in this life, that you are the only chance they may have in their lifetime to hear that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth and the life. There's an Uber driver uh, on Maui a couple days ago. I usually witness to every one of them. And, and uh, I told he was an atheist, didn't believe nothing. I don't believe that, don't believe that, don't believe that. I said, sir, and this is what I've told so many of them. I said, listen to me. I know you're, you really, really want me to get out of your car right now. And you can't wait till I get out because I'm making you real uncomfortable. I said, but listen to me. God sent me here as a messenger to you, as a warning. I said, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you die lost five seconds after you die, you will wake in a horrible nightmare that you'll never wake up from. Why don't you reconsider what you, why don't you take all of your excuses and realize they won't do you any good when you're dead unless you confess Jesus the only way to God. You cannot go to this beautiful heaven and brother, I desperately want to be in heaven with you. Why don't you accept Jesus today? Wow, that takes boldness. No, it don't. All I had to do was put myself in his shoes. If it was me that was sitting there driving that Uber car on my way to hell, thinking that I was right. What would I want somebody to do if it was me? How would I want someone to react if that was my son that was lost driving that cab on his way to hell? The, Je the reason Jesus saw and was moved is because he loves the way that we ought to love. Come on, we've all been guilty of seeing and being disgusted or seeing and saying, well, I wouldn't want to be him on judgment day. But church, I'm telling you, we need to see and be moved. Uh, you know, I, I say this to people sometimes. I've said this to a lot of drug addicts, and it really makes sense to them. I say, you know what? Satan's painkiller is instant but temporary. God's painkiller is a process, but it's permanent. You got to tell that drug addict that the, the temporary instant painkiller is only going to take him the wrong way. You know, I, me, and, me and my wife was driving down the road a couple years ago. And there was, a, there was an old man that had a case of beer under his arm. And he was walking down the road and he was staggering drunk and traffic was going by. And he almost went out in front of a car and I got out and I ran. And I came up and I grabbed him and I said, whoa, 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 old timer. Hang on, hang on. Don't you go down the street, buddy. Let's get over here. I said, I, I said what, what's going on, buddy? I said, what's your name? He said, Billy Brown. I said, Billy Brown. You, I, I said, you, you almost got hit by that car. He said, I made it all the way through Vietnam, and now I can't even find my house. I said, Billy, let me tell you about a man that died on a cross so he could take every sin you've ever committed your whole life and erase it like it never happened, and he could cast your sins to the bottom of the sea, and never he could make you brand. So he said, I don't think Jesus would save me. You don't know what I've done in Vietnam. You don't know what I've done. I said, brother, Jesus' blood covers everything. I, I sit there. I took him through the sinner's prayer. He prayed. He cried. I don't know what happened to Billy Brown after, after that I helped him off the street. I don't really know, but I tell you, it's easy, church. Put yourself in their shoes. What if that was one of my little boys 40 years from now when I'm dead? What would I expect a preacher to do to my sons? What would I expect a preacher to do to my, one of my friends or my family? Look at this in Luke 12, 47. I got to close up. He said, and a servant who knows what the master wants, listen to this carefully, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. But someone who does not know, then does something wrong, will be punished only lightly. This is in the NLT, just these two verses. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about us. You've been given much. Come on, you got pastors that preach the truth. You got worship music in your car. You, you, you know the truth. You've been given much. So much is going to be required of you in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. That's why Jesus was hard on the religious 
But he had compassion on people that didn't know any better. Like the woman at the well. He went to her. He didn't condemn her and call her a devil. Do you know why? Because he had the ability to put himself in her shoes. She was only doing the best she could. Jesus knew the upbringing she had. Maybe she had to steal to eat. Maybe she saw her mom having five or ten husbands or jumping bed to bed. But Jesus said, woman, if you keep drinking of this water, he wasn't talking about the water in the well. He said, you're going to be thirsty again. He said, if you can keep jumping bed to bed, you're going to be thirsty again. You can keep getting drunk. You're going to be thirsty again. You're going to keep getting high. You're going to be thirsty again. But he said, I have a water that you drink of and you'll never thirst again. I'm telling you, all Jesus did was put himself in her shoes and realize that he was throwing her a lifeline. Throwing her a lifeline. I told, uh, we had a waitress that was, or a waiter that was flamboyantly gay one time. And the same deal, I said, God, give me a word for him. And he came by, and once again, I complimented him and everything. And I said, I said, God, Holy Ghost, tell me what to say to him. Tell me what to say. He came by uh, about the third or fourth time, and I said, Brother, God, t God gave me a word to tell you. Once again, me? Yes. I said, God told me to throw you a lifeline. He said, what's the lifeline? I was like, yeah, God, what's the lifeline? And it came out of my mouth. I said, Jesus said to tell you that he is all you need. He immediately started crying and he took off running, holding his, just bawling in his hands. He, he didn't even come back to the table. I don't know where he went. Someone else had came. But he was bawling and crying. I didn't know what it meant, but he knew what it meant. How did I do that? Not because I'm better than anybody. Not because I can quote more scriptures. Not because I have more degrees hanging on the wall. Because I had the ability in Jesus' name to put myself in his shoes. Let me tell you something. If you saw your child laying in a gutter with a needle in their arm or high, would you need to pray for boldness? Not if it was your child. So we, we, this is us as Christians. Well, God, God, if you want me to witness to that guy, uh, let that stop sign turn into a buffalo. <laughs> you know, uh, let, let, uh, okay, Jesus, if you want me to witness to her, spell my name with the stars. <laughs> if it was your child, you don't need to have to say, well, I didn't feel led. Yeah. Well... I, I didn't feel led, led to witness it. No, if it was your child, you would be moved because of the love. So if we don't share Jesus, it's not a lack of boldness, but a, a lack of love. They can come to the piano so people think I'm almost done. <laughs> no, I am. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? 714? All right. Uh, I only got two more hours. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> My little boy Elvis told me, and I'll tell you this in my closing. We saw on the History Channel, we saw the KKK on there. He said, Daddy, what are those people? Are they bad? I said, yes, buddy, they're bad. He said, what do they believe? I said, they believe that, that if, if you're not white, that you're the devil, you're mean, and all this. I was telling him. He said, well, why, why don't God just kill them? I thought about that for a minute, and I said, Elvis? I said, because God has the ability to put himself in their shoes. I said, think about it. Those guys were raised by monsters. They were raised by haters and racists and the worst kind of people. I said, Elvis, if I, if I raised you like that, you might be one of those guys wearing those uniforms. I said, we need to pray that God will send somebody with the Holy Ghost that can convict them of their wrong so they don't die and go to hell. We can't look at our enemies the way the world does. We have to put ourselves in their shoes. I remember when we were in getting uh, gas the other day in Oklahoma. Last story, we're going to pray. And we were getting gas, and, and Selena, my wife, said, uh, go back in there. She, or she said, stop, i got to go pray with that lady. So we stop. She goes up there, and she walks in there, and, and I see her talking to the lady, the cashier. She's talking, talking, talking. The line is getting longer and longer and longer and longer behind her. She's talking. Then pretty soon I've seen Selena grab both of her hands and start praying. And I can, I can see through the glass and Selena's like.
And all the people, the line was so long and people started coming outside and holding their cases of beer outside because they didn't want to be in the revival. They were outside on the curb, on the sidewalk, waiting until she got done praying. And there's a big long, she prayed for a good five minutes. And when she came out, cried all her stuff off. She looked like Count Dracula. Scared me a little bit. Came outside and, and she, and, and, and uh, I said, Selena, you had uh, the line all backed up there with your revival. She said, you know what? I don't care because people need to see somebody that's not ashamed to pray. If the Muslims can pray, we can pray. She said, it's the people with the Holy Ghost that should be controlling the atmosphere, not the world. We should be controlling the atmosphere. I tell you, as you stand, it will do you the most good. You will have God's stories and adventures that will not stop. You should have God's stories that are not, that are not more than a week old. Did you hear me? I, I, people get up and tell them, oh, you hear them get up? I've heard preachers get up and they're still talking about Granny getting healed of cancer in 1979. Well, praise God for Granny in 1979. But if you don't have God's stories that are new every week, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing.